we sat down with Justin Grichard, Managing Director and Co-Portfolio Manager at Oak Tree Capital Management's Real Estate Debt Group. Where is real estate leveraged today? And what cities is Oak Tree deploying capital in? We talked with Grichard to find out. Cool, so we have Justin Guichard uh, with us here today uh, on the uh, real estate debt team at Oak Tree Capital Management. So I'll be asking you a couple questions today just sort of about the real estate debt asset class and uh, where we are. So uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk about the corporate credit cycle here today at the uh, PDI event. Uh, where does the real estate cycle lie in comparison to the corporate credit cycle? Yeah, you know, when we think about real estate credit, uh, which obviously real estate as an asset class has had its wind, the wind at its back for, for some time now since the sort of the depths of the global financial crisis. Um, real estate asset price appreciation has been pretty robust. And frankly, uh, we were growing more cautious on real estate a couple of years ago. But from where we sit today, from a relative perspective, as we look at real estate versus corporates, we think real estate is actually pretty well positioned. Um, one of the big reasons for that is when you look at Dodd-Frank and Basel III and these other regulations that came into to play um, you know, in various times in the last couple of years in particular, um, these regulations really were focused on avoiding a lot of the challenges that we saw during the global financial crisis. So they were cracking down on, in essence, uh, residential and commercial real estate lending as a way of avoiding some of the challenges that we experienced in the the 2007 through 2010 type time frame. Um, what that's done is that's really kept a lid on leverage within real estate. So if you look at uh, leverage as a percent of GDP in real estate, it was about 25% of GDP going into the global financial crisis. Today it's closer to 20. So real estate leverage has come down, whereas corporate leverage was uh, 45% of GDP going into the global financial crisis and is now 46, so it's actually surpassed where we were during the GFC. Um, so when we look at sort of the frothiness, as I sort of think about it, within, within these various markets, we see real estate as reasonably well positioned, primarily, primarily because the regulatory forces have been so focused on keeping sort of uh, these, these markets in what I would call much greater supply-demand balance. So by taking many of the banks' activities out of the hands of the banks, um, we've kept these leverage caps pretty consistent. If you look at, for example, CMBS leverage today, um, so we look at commercial mortgage-backed securities, uh, particularly on the conduit side, because they're fairly transparent. They offer a pretty good view of where investors are uh, today as it relates to uh, certain loan covenants, spreads, uh, leverage levels and the like. Um, and that really tells us that the, the markets are, are um, appropriately uh, you know, risk averse and that there's better, better opportunities from where we sit in real estate um, than, than in some other asset classes that we're looking at at Oak Tree. It's interesting you talk about the leverage levels that uh, that probably has an effect on valuation. So, uh, given that dynamic, uh, where are uh, real estate valuations today? Real estate values are high, particularly in the gateway markets. Um, so, the gateway markets: San Francisco, New York, Boston, Chicago, L.A., Washington D.C. saw sort of an incredible run since 2000, the depths of 2009 and 10. I think the, the growth in those markets has, has slowed a little bit, asset price growth, and actually we've seen greater asset price appreciation in some of the markets that I would characterize as more high growth markets. So we look a lot at markets uh, you know, across Florida like Orlando, Tampa, Phoenix, uh, certain markets in Texas, uh, Seattle, Portland, San Jose, Orange County, San Diego. These are markets that have healthy supply demand dynamics but aren't as much the focal point for, for global investors. Um, and many of those markets are healthier now from a supply demand perspective. If you look at construction, um, for example, as a percent of existing stock, we actually see greater supply demand imbalances in the gateway markets than we do uh, in these high growth markets that I referenced earlier. For our real estate debt platform is more focused on larger transactions with uh, more sophisticated sponsors who generally have better access to liquidity. 
we find that for the debt side of our business, we're more active in the gateway markets. That being said, on the equity side of our business, where we've been deploying capital since, since 1995 and out of opportunistic equity funds. I was actually just going to ask about that. Uh, like you said, New York, San Francisco uh, versus Phoenix and Seattle. Um, so the, the former is something that you guys are much more concentrated on on the debt side than on the equity side. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly it. And what, what's driving that concentration for the debt side? So on the, if you look at the top seven markets for office, um, you know, the, the transaction volume in those top seven markets actually is greater than the transaction volume in the other 43 markets out of the top 50 combined. You may have on a large uh, office building in New York City, for example, you may have a single asset, single borrower, CMBS securitization that gives you more choice in terms of where you want to participate in the capital structure. And that's also an important for element for us as we're investing real estate debt. Um, because we are active in both liquid securities and private loans. If one of the buildings that you've uh, uh, backed on the funding side uh, encounters trouble of some sort, do you guys ever take the keys to use a corporate credit term? You know, it, it is a last resort for us. Um, it is, from, from our perspective, you know, the last resort in, in terms of protecting our LP's capital. You know, we're really focused on working with, with good borrowers. I'm sorry, we're on the real estate equity spectrum, right? Core, core plus, et cetera. Um, are you finding the best debt opportunities? So I would say, you know, one of the, the business plans that we're most comfortable with, frankly, is sort of a value add business plan. Um, it's where we're most active on the opportunistic side of our business. And therefore, you know, we're very comfortable with these business plans that are generally buying assets that for whatever reason are not achieving market occupancy and putting dollars into those assets, CapEx, appropriate TIs and leasing commissions in order to get those buildings back up to market occupancy. Um, you know, I'm speaking primarily of office, industrial, multifamily type opportunities. And so that's a business plan we're very comfortable with on the equity side. And as you might expect, given our familiarity with it, we're also quite comfortable with it on the debt side. Um, we have invested in some, what I'd characterize as more core plus assets on the debt side. Um, you know, we're, we're really not doing a lot of construction, although it is a, a business plan that we will pursue to the extent the right, right protection. And now the last question, um, LPs have moved into the uh, real estate debt space uh, uh, quite significantly post GFC. So what are some of the questions that investors are not asking that they should be asking? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we hear most often, sort of a common refrain is, oh, I see so many real estate debt investors now coming through the door that the asset class is experiencing a real boom in fundraising. And I guess I'd, I'd put that into to context a little bit differently. So when we look at real estate debt, um, you know, the last numbers that I saw suggested that real estate debt fundraising was about $28 billion last year. I can tame, name two opportunistic funds. Um, that raised $35 billion just between those two funds in the last year. So as a, you know, when you think about real estate debt as an asset class, I'd say it's still really in its infancy. Um, the other thing that I'd highlight as it relates to real estate debt is that we look often at the, the amount of capital available for real estate private equity, both value add and opportunistic private equity, because those are really our core clients. Um, and we think that those, uh, balances are, are uh, really appropriate um, for where we are in the market today. As real estate private equity dry powder has grown, real estate debt dry powder has grown alongside it. Um, so we think it's relatively in balance and that the concerns about the amount of maybe new managers coming through the door are a little bit overblown. Thank you so much for joining us, Justin, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Appreciate your time.